you tend to see things like this, uh, trials that involve uh, individuals who have a very high profile. And we generally associate those things in other areas of the country to have two such high profile trials going on at the same time, juries deliberating at the same time, is really unique in New England. New England is very much a consolidated area. When you talk about Boston, it's not a place that's far away. You talk about the Fall River case, the Aaron Hernandez case, which is heard in Fall River, it's 20 miles, 25 miles up the road. So it's not a great distance to do. When you talk about the Boston Marathon bombing, it is an event that a lot of people in New England know about if have not participated or actually been to the Boston Marathon to view it or been involved in uh, going to a Patriots game and watching uh, Hernandez play football on TV or in, a, in the stadium themselves. So the combination of two high profile cases also so inextricably linked to New England uh, is rather unique in this particular case. I think the preliminary comments that some of the jurors have already made to the media outside of the courthouse, uh, liking it to the most difficult thing they've ever had to do, uh, how several people expressed the fact that they had seen Aaron Hernandez play football when he was playing with the Patriots, uh, I think gives some, some insight anyway to how difficult it is to sit and to to have in your hands someone's life, uh, and in this particular case, convicting um, Hernandez for the first degree murder charge and him being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. If you look at an individual who's 25 years old, and then you understand life expectancy tables, that he could very well spend the next 55 to 60 years in prison. It's a long time, and it's a very serious undertaking to sit on a jury and to have that much weight in your hands, you want to get it right. Uh, but some of the comments of the foreperson of the jury is uh, that they can rest easy firmly believing that they got it right. That to me indicates they spent a lot of the time deliberating uh, about the facts, about the evidence, uh, making sure that the prosecution was appropriately held to their burden of proving the elements of the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and to the satisfaction of the men and women on that jury. Uh, I think it was a very deliberative process. Uh, I think it's a true testament to the justice system when it is allowed to run its course and uh, get what the jury feels is a fair and a just result and then putting it back in the hands of the judge for sentencing purposes. My understanding is that as a, under Massachusetts law, conviction for first degree murder carries with it an automatic appeal. Now, a lot of people who don't follow trials up closely don't realize that the more difficult part of this is, in fact, the trial. It's not the appeal because the trial is very, very fact specific. The reason that you have a stenographer in the courtroom taking down verbatim, word for word, what is said during the trial, noting the objections uh, to the admission of evidence or the admission of certain testimony is a key element during the trial. But when you appeal something, you appeal it on what we call appealing it on the record. And the record is of what happened at the lower level. So there's not going to be any new testimony on appeal. You're pointing out the fact that there was something that happened during the course of the trial that somehow interfered with Hernandez being able to get a fair trial. Now, in most instances, when you file an appeal, you have very limited reasons you can file an appeal. You can file an appeal, for the most part, that there was an error of law that the judge allowed something in that she should not have allowed in. She didn't allow something in she should have allowed in. That there was an abuse of judicial discretion. Again, pointing the finger at the judge saying, you made a mistake. You exercised your discretion as a trial judge and you did it inappropriately. That there's newly discovered evidence and even that is such a high bar because you'll have to show that even if something were to be found today, the defense would have to literally prove that we looked for anything, we couldn't have found this, and even through our most diligent efforts, we didn't know this existed, and that it has a material effect, and could have had a material effect had we known about it, uh, and we had presented this at the course of the trial. Ineffective assistance of legal counsel, that his lawyers were so inept that, but for their ineptness, he would not have been found, not, he would not have been found guilty. 
those are very, very high bars to set. And there is no such thing as appealing something solely because I didn't do it. That's not a nature or a basis of a legal appeal in a court proceeding. You just can't say I didn't do it and the jury got it wrong. So it, the bar is set very, very high. And that's why most cases when appealed, most criminal convictions when appealed, are, are sustained. They sustain the jury verdict and they sustain the court's imposition of punishment. So uh, as high as the bar was set in a criminal case, it's even higher on appeal. Very difficult.